let me talk a little bit about tape. Very interesting process of how it works. So if you've got a piece of tape, and this is going to be a side view. Tape would be 2,500 feet long, but let's just cut it and take a magnifying glass and blow it up and look at it from a side view. You've got a piece of mylar, which is a thin piece of plastic as the backing. And then on top of that, you've got all this magnetic material that gets glued onto it. In that magnetic material is a whole compound and a host of other kinds of materials. Now, why would you need that other than just magnetic materials that get glued onto a piece of plastic that goes by the head that gets magnetized? Is because as it's going over the heads, this is metal oxide, sort of similar to rust that you'd see on a nail, it's sort of this reddish, dark material. And it gets glued onto this piece of mylar. As the tape moves, it needs to be flexible enough not to crack, not to dry out to the point where you get it flaking off. So they put other materials in the formula so that it'll actually flow across the heads. You think about it, you've got metal across the metal head, scraping across it, unless they do something to make it flow easily. One of the things they used to put in it is little droplets of oil so that it would sort of lubricate it as it's being tensioned across the heads. And these little drops of oil, some formulas used to use whale oil. It was a very special kind of oil because it was light enough to be lubricating but still not leave a residue. Just interesting to know that they put all sorts of other materials in this so that the tape would be able to slide across the heads without damaging the heads, without damaging the tape. If you look at a top view of a piece of tape and it's passing over the head and magnetism is being spit out onto the tape, there's little magnetic particles in the tape because they're iron. And as the magnetism gets spit onto the tape, the particles will flip sides and become more lined up and magnetized in one little direction. And then tape moves along and it gets magnetized in another direction. So it's capturing the fluctuations of the electrical signal by fluctuating magnetic fields that magnetize certain parts of the tape in different intensities. When it's read back and played back, the head itself reads those magnetic intensity fluctuations and changes it back to electrical signals. Pretty complicated for analog recording, but that's how it works. When we were talking about bias signals, why do you need a bias signal to get this to work right? is because these magnetic particles are glued to the backing of the tape. So to get them to be free enough to be able to flip sides and align themselves magnetically, you have to sort of shake them up. And I kind of think of it as a box full of marbles. These things are just sort of vibrating around and they can move around much easier. If they were static and glued to the backing, take much more energy to get them to start moving and flipping. But that said, there's only so many molecules of iron oxide or ferrite oxide on the tape. So if the magnetic field is really great, only so many can align in one direction and then it stops aligning because there's no more molecules to align because it's a finite number. And if there's a very weak signal of magnetism, very few of them will flip and you'll get mostly just the noise of the tape running over the heads. So you've got a noise floor with tape, which we call tape hiss, and you've got an upper level of how much signal the tape can actually handle. This is all about gain structures and making sure you don't overload things and get distortion. Now, the beautiful thing about it is that people sometimes think that analog tape machines and analog recordings, there's this sort of urban legend that it sounds better than digital recording, that analog tape is special and it's, it's better than digital. Well, the reason that people say that sometimes is, and I don't know if I agree or not, because analog tape has its problems and its benefits. Digital has its problems and its benefits. Even though you'll probably mostly work in the digital domain, there are times when I keep a tape machine around because I want to bounce out and hit tape and then bounce back into the digital domain so that I can capture that good sound that I like. The sound I like on analog tape is the way the tape works to store the sound. So if you hit the tape with harder magnetic fields, it'll start flipping these magnetic particles and aligning them until there's very little left to align. So what happens is input keeps going up and the output sort of gets softer and softer and can't quite maintain a linear one-to-one -one relationship. 
So what you get is you get this kind of a system where you've got an input and an output on this tape, and you put more signal in if it's biased properly. It should have worked linearly until you get up to the top of all of the molecules, and pretty soon there's no more to flip so that you can apply more input signal and you get the same or a little more output signal. It's like a compressor, and it's a physical compressor of how the tape works. My contention that everything in the world sounds better when it's compressed, that's the reason is because the balance of the harmonic structure against the fundamental frequency gets a little dynamically changed, as we discussed with compressors. And so naturally it'll sound better because you're hearing more of the harmonic structure as opposed to the fundamental. So you basically dynamically control the harmonic structure and alter it. And so if you work the tape properly, and we used to be very expert at being able to how to bias the tape machine, how hard to hit it, how much signal to put into the tape machine when you hit it hard with a bass guitar or a kick drum and you really slam it into the tape, it thickens it up because of the property of the tape. And so you tend to get more bottom. You almost play the tape machine as if it was an instrument, if you're the engineer. And I worked with many, many engineers that had their own techniques of working with the tape machine to create the sound that they were looking for. So it really is sort of a physical type of compressor that is a physical property of how the tape works. I'm glad I went through that dissertation because now you understand why some people say analog tape sounds so great. It's because the tape is compressing it. As long as you hit one piece of analog tape, you get that analog sound. You don't have to record the whole project on 24 track analog or even at the end of the process, after everything's recorded, you can end up bouncing your stereo master to an analog two track. And a lot of people do that because they want to get that analog sound because they still think it sounds really great. Analog tape is very difficult to edit. It took a lot of work to be able to cut tape and splice it to other pieces. And if you got it wrong, the undo function wasn't just that easy. You had to take that piece of tape and put it back in place and retape it in place. But the beauty is, is that you could do that. Now, when they say looping, I'm sure you've heard of being able to loop in Pro Tools. It really was tape loops. We used to take maybe eight bars of a good drum performance, cut it out of a piece of analog tape, and tape the beginning to the end. And then we would put it back on the tape machine, and we'd have second engineers with mic stands holding the tape out around the room, and the tape would go and just loop. And then we'd take the output of that tape machine and record it on a new tape machine. So there are all sorts of tricks that you could do with analog tape that you could similarly do in Pro Tools, but much easier in Pro Tools, where you can just highlight a section, say loop play, and it just loops. It's a whole different process. Much easier to use digital, but still the analog sounds were really good too. There's something to be said for that.